All right, this morning we're going to be in 1 John, and uh, I've titled this message Word of Life Part 2 because we're going to continue the sermon series I started back in January. Last time I was up here, I don't know if there's a time limit that you can't call it a sermon series, but we're just going to go with it. So um, so we're going to be in chapter 1 and in the beginning of chapter 2 this morning. So to start with, we'll do an introduction and then we'll do a quick run through the first four verses. Our main text is going to be verse 5 through chapter 2, verse 2. Okay, so John, when he's writing this letter, he's writing to a church that's been under attack. Okay, he, they've, they've been, there were some people that were part of their congregation that have left and they're influencing them with some bad doctrine and some bad ideas about spirituality. Okay, so they're getting, they're getting a conflicting story. And I'm sure plenty of us have experience with conflicting stories. Like you ever hear a noise in the room next to you and walk in and then you've got two stories that don't stop. That by the, t- by the time those two stories are done, everybody's guilty and nobody in there has the authority to be right. So um, in those situations, it can be pretty tough. But the first thing that John does is he reaffirms what they've been taught about Jesus, about who Jesus is. At the same time, he shows the authority that he and the apostles have to teach and to lead them. Okay, And also that these other people do not have that authority. They don't have what John and the apostles have. Okay, so the first four verses, we'll read them to begin with. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, and that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Okay, so he starts off with the defense explaining who Jesus is, right? Countering what they're being told by the outside. Um, I kind of talked about this last time, but it's been a minute. It might not be fresh on your mind. Uh, But anyway, there was this belief of Gnosticism that was starting to come into the church. It really took hold in the second century, but it was starting here. And they had all kinds of beliefs about spirituality. They believed, you know, spirit, spirit things were good. Matter or created things were evil. And they claimed things like Jesus only appeared to be in human form. He wasn't really in human form. Um, they taught, some of these things sound familiar, they taught that the God in the Old Testament wasn't the same as Jesus. That was one thing that was going on through that movement. And these teachings still go on, right? They still go on today. We can see it in a lot of cults, whether they're mainstream cults or or small ones, where they distort who Jesus is, or they use Scripture as more of a guideline. They They don't have Scripture as authoritative. Some of the things that they were saying was that sin wasn't the problem. Okay, that sin wasn't the problem in our lives. Um, The problem was we needed to be more spiritual, uh, however that happens. But God loves you no matter what, right? You can do whatever you want. You're not really expected to change. Sin isn't the problem. Um, But they were still, they wouldn't deny that Jesus Jesus existed or what he took. Not everything he taught. So a little bit of truth mixed in with lies, okay? And that can be very manipulative. Um, and this, this type of thinking we can see today, gaining momentum in different churches um, where people are trying to make the teachings of the apostles or the teachings in Scripture fit their image or fit culture. Okay, so we're trying to make a God in the image of man. That's what they're trying to do. Laying aside truths that they've held for centuries. So as a response... To this going on, John writes his opening to begin with that he saw, heard, touched, and looked upon Christ while he was alive in human form on the earth, but also after his resurrection and up until his ascension. Okay, So he was an eyewitness to the life and the work of Jesus. 
when he writes looked upon, that word in the original language, I'm probably not saying this right, theomai, okay, it means to contemplate or to behold. So that they knew him, knew him well, and truly studied him. So the first thing that he writes is to remove any question about who Jesus was, right? Fully man, as described in these verses, and eternally God, as described by the name that he calls Jesus by, the word of life. The combination of those two descriptions of Jesus, the word is the logos, which means the word reason, the judgment, the intelligence, is what that word translates to of eternal life. Okay, so that's what he's calling him. And the title, he's describing Jesus as the eternal word of God. And as he goes through this, he also is presenting the proof, as we've said, of the authority that he has as a teacher for the church and as someone to lead them. Okay, basically telling them that everything that they're hearing outside is nonsense. This is the truth. This is how we know, and this is what happens. Okay, so after he goes through this, oh, sorry. So anyway, Paul does the same thing in some of his letters. Paul has to do the same, but he's dealing with some of the same issues, right? People outside the church who are trying to influence. So he's writing this to help them identify the truth from the lies as they can. Okay. If someone is professing to believe and follow Christ, how does that look? That's where we go in this first part, of the rest of chapter 1 and into chapter 2. Okay, What does it look like to have a relationship with Christ in somebody's life? So there's three points that we're going to hit. The first one is walk in the light. The second one is confess your sins. And the third one is obey God's commands. And at the end of this, we're going to see how Jesus is our advocate to the Father. Okay. So I'm, I'll go ahead and read the rest of these verses. We'll be in verses 5 through 7 to start. But verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not just for ours only, but also for the whole world. Okay, so in verse 5, he's, he starts appealing again to the authority of their message because what does he say about their message? This is a message which we have heard from him. So this is from Jesus. He's saying this is God's message from God. Okay, starting, starting with that, and then he goes right into a declarative statement that he makes about God. Okay, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Okay, evil and holiness are used, or light and dark are used here for those. So when he's describing God as light and in him is no darkness at all, we have a perfectly holy God. Okay, there is no darkness in that. Now, then he goes on to what that means for a lifestyle or for a believer, okay? If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. Okay, so as he goes into that, we're getting into his explanations. If we claim to have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. He doesn't waste any time, right? He's just straight to the point. If you say you're with God... And God is perfect light, but our lives are not reflecting that, then it can't be so, right? Paul mentions this in Romans, Romans 6, 1 through 8. So what should we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Now, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore... 
we were buried with him through baptism into death, and Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Okay, so Matthew Henry's commentary on this gives us a better understanding of walking in darkness so that we can get through this. So anyway, to walk in darkness is to live and act according to such ignorance, error, and erroneous practice contrary to the fundamental dictates of our holy religion. Okay, so this, this condemnation is not on believers who, are, who have sinned, who have stumbled, right? This is active rebellion to God's word in someone's life. That's what he says here when he says, according to such ignorance, error, and erroneous practice. So he's trying to give them some tools in discernment when they're getting these teachings from other people. Okay, Jesus addresses this same issue when it comes to the Christian walk or the Christian's life. In Matthew 7, 17 through 20, every good, so every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Okay, so the fruits will show. Um, Martin Luther has a quote, We are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. So a relationship with God is going to bear fruit in our lives. The changed heart of the believer is going to show through our actions and through our lives. So as followers of Christ, we cannot you know, promote or celebrate sin. And anyone who does that and claims to be a Christian, you know, we shouldn't be following or giving too much attention to. Some may claim to be Christians. They go to church, they read the Bible, they promote things, they're, they know the verses. But they don't know Jesus. They don't know Christ. Okay, You can have knowledge without belief. We can know scripture without belief. Now he goes on from there. In verse 7, he says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, we are brothers. We have fellowship with one another. Okay, We have, we have communion with each other through Christ. We're given a new heart, a desire to follow Christ. And there's, and we're conv- sorry, we're given conviction for our sins whenever we do sin. So we won't be walking with Christ and living opposed to what God has commanded. Okay, so along with this first part, the first thing is that the faith will be evident. Now, in verses eight through ten. We'll hit the second part. So, confess your sins. If we say that we have no sins, we defeat, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. Okay, so none are without sin, and trying to minimize or ignore sin is, it's a lie, okay? So someone may not say flat out that they don't sin or that they're without sin, but we can just turn on the news and look around and see wickedness being excused over and over and over again, whether it's excused by the people doing it or excused by, you know, the media, the whoever is involved. They're not calling wickedness wicked. Okay, that's excusing sin. We have God's word to guide us. We know, we can know what God says about these things. Despite 
how culture may see. Okay. Romans 3.23, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Okay, before we can know Christ as Savior, we have to understand that we need a Savior, right? We tend, I know I do, definitely, we tend to make little of the sins in our lives. Like, it's just not, it's not as bad as, you know, somebody else's for sure. And it's definitely not as bad as, like, this side of the room. Um, over here, I know I'm not in that. They need Jesus. That's, that's the rough side, Right? But where the truth is, we all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. I've got no righteousness before God, right? I'm made righteous by Jesus when I confess my sins to him and repent. So we can't make little of our sins. So then in verse 10, as he goes forward, he says, he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So to begin with, he says, if we talk about walking in the light and we're not, it makes us a liar. Now he says, if we claim to be without sin, we make God a liar. That's a pretty strong accusation there, right? And, uh, and it might even sound a little over the top, but not if we look back through God's word and we know what God's word says about the sinful state of man outside of salvation, outside of Christ. Um, I just picked a couple verses because I don't want to go too big on that. Psalm 14, 1 through 3. So the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none good, not even one. Isaiah 64, 6. We are all infected like and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds... They are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall. Our sins sweep us away like wind. Okay, for everybody who's getting thoroughly depressed by my message so far, hang on. Because it takes a turn, okay? We're going to get there. But, you know, God's word is clear about the state of man outside of Christ, right? We deceive ourselves. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever watched... Uh, the videos of like street preachers, open air preachers, and they approach people and they ask them these questions. Ray Comfort's got the questions that, you know, are you a good person? Um, what makes a good person? Those kinds of things. And generally the answer is going to be, well, yeah, I'm pretty good, right? Um, we judge ourselves on a standard that we create. Okay, we can look, we look around us and we're like, yeah, I'm, I'm in a pretty good state. I'm a pretty good guy. I think I've outweighed the bad that I've done, okay? Even if I'm not perfect, I'm definitely not bad, right? But that's something that we've got to understand. When it comes to God, when it comes to God's perfect holiness, not bad's not good enough. <laughs> you know, being, being nice is not good enough. Just be nice. Um, well, <laughs> Bodhi Bauckham kind of, he calls that the 11th commandment of the progressive church, right? Thou shalt be nice. That's all you got to do. Um, and it's true. That's how people act. So we've got to be careful. We cannot fall into that trap. Okay? When we stand before our judge, he's not going to look at our life and go to his chalkboard and be like, okay, Tony's got this many right, and here's where he messed up. That's going to be the bigger side. But... That's not how that works. Okay, we're going to be compared by God's standard. We're not going to be judged by the standard of the world or the, stand, the standard of men, right? We're going to be judged by God's standard. And God is, the Bible says, holy, holy, holy. Okay, so there's only one way that we can stand before God in His righteousness, and that's to have God's righteousness cover us. Okay, only with Christ can our sin be dealt with. In Christ... Through the work of the Holy Spirit, we're continually being sanctified to be more like Him. But this is not on our own, and it requires a denial of the sinful things and following Him, repenting, turning, and following Him. And the only way that this is possible is through the power of Christ over sin. Okay, That's what Scripture is talking about. I believe I read it in that Romans passage. It talks about being freed from sin. And being slaves to sin no more. 
Outside of Christ, sin is the master that's in control. Okay, you, we, we all serve something. Um, and when, when we're in our sin, like I said, we'll find ways to justify it, right? We'll find ways to make us, make us feel better about it or just to, to go along, okay? But the conviction of the Holy Spirit in us is what draws us to repentance and draws us to Christ whenever we sin. Okay, and that's a, that's a blessing. That's a blessing that humbles us and it comes with salvation. So we need to remember the power to overcome our sins comes from Christ, from God, right? But we are not without sin. So, going into chapter 2. So we had, we had faith that was going to be made evident as you walk in the light, right? Then we've seen that we need to confess our sins. So, verse, chapter 2, verse 1, the beginning of it, we're told to keep God's commands. So, my little children... These things I write to you so that you may not sin. That's where I'm going to stop at right there. So we're still in the you are all sinners part of the message, but we're getting close. John is writing to them because he cares, right? He's telling them these things for their benefit. He's not trying to, to put them down. He's not acting superior to them. But he loves them too much for them to be led astray by these other teachings and these other people. Okay, I, thought, I found it interesting here, though, that right after he says, if you claim to, sin, to not sin, you make God a liar, and he goes right into don't sin. But I don't, th- I don't think he's trying to confuse them, right? It's not a denial of the reality that sin is in our lives and that we're going to sin. It's going to happen. But we cannot be mistaken that those things don't matter, that sin doesn't matter, okay? Or that our sins aren't that bad, because every sin is a rebellion against God, against God's commands. Our sins don't just have consequences in this life. Every sin that we justify in ourselves is saying that we know better than God. We understand what's really okay and what's not. Now, at the same time that John is telling them that they should not sin, he follows this right up with, with his comfort, with the comfort that we have. Okay, so now now that we've got through bad, 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 he takes the opportunity and points them back to the cross in the next few verses. Okay, we won't stop sinning, but we will grow, and our sins will lose power on us as we continue to be sanctified. But when we do sin, when we do stumble, when we do not act righteously, how... Can we stand before God when we continue to sin? So we finish verse 1 and then verse 2. Going into verse 2. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He Himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And I'm fairly certain I don't pronounce propitiation correctly. So somebody can correct me on that later. So our advocate, right, our atoning sacrifice for our sins, the complete sacrifice to cover our sins, not partial, not more needed, not this is going to require work, okay? The hope that we have in him is the promise that when we're adopted into his family and we become children of God, part of the body of Christ, that Jesus' perfect sacrifice will cover our sins. Not just our sins to that point. Our sins, all of them. That's our hope in life and death, right? That Jesus will, as our advocate, as the only one who can go for our behalf to the Father, will say, Those are mine, right? We are covered by his righteousness. All of us who confess our sins, repent, and follow him. Because he's the only one that could accomplish it. 
Okay? Jesus said it himself on the cross too. He said, it is finished, right? It is finished. It was done. No more is needed. Christ and Christ's righteousness. R.C. Sproul calls this, which I'm sure more people do, double imputation. Okay? And it's a quick quote here. So at the heart of the gospel is double imputation. My sin imputed to Jesus and Jesus' righteousness imputed to me. In this twofold transaction, we see that God, who does not negotiate sin, who doesn't compromise his own integrity with our salvation, but rather punishes sin fully and really after it's been imputed to Jesus, retains his own righteousness, and so he becomes, he is both just and justifier. He is both just and justifier. My sin imputed to Christ and his righteousness imputed to me. Right, and, and when Christ took the punishment for those sins, he took the full punishment. He took all of it. The unimaginable price that was paid for our sins. In Romans 5, 1 through 11... Paul writes, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without sin, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. Through whom we have now received this reconciliation. Don't fall for the false teachers. Don't follow the false ideas of what it takes to get right and make yourself right and become more spiritual or any of that. Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation, the only one who could reconcile us to the Father. Through his perfect life, Spurgeon quote says it was it will always give a christian the greatest calm quiet and ease and peace to think of the perfect righteousness of christ how often are the saints of god downcast and sad i do not think they ought to be i do not think they would be if they could always see their perfection in christ there are some who are, who are always talking about corruption and the depravity of the heart and the innate evil of the soul. And this is quite true, but why not go further and remember that we are perfect in Christ? Jesus bought us at a heavy price, right? Bought us. Verse 10. Sorry. I don't know what I wrote there. I apologize. Let's go back to that. Jesus bought us. Um, it's one thing to know I should have been verse 2. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Okay? It's, and we know that, right? We know those verses that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. But I hope, and it's good. It's good that we know those. We should hear those a lot. We should say those a lot. Okay? But don't let it become repetition. Don't just let it become something we say. And understand that he died for your sins. He died for my sins. He died for Tony's sins. It's personal. Okay? It's relational. 
my sins laid on him and his righteousness laid on me. That is what him being our advocate to the Father is. That's the hope and the message of the gospel, right? We're given the gift that we could not earn. Our sins transferred to him, his righteousness transferred to us. That while Christ received the full wrath of the sins that we committed, that in that, he says, forgive them, Father, because they know not what they do. This is, what, this is what we have in Christ. This is the truth of the Savior that we have, of the God that we have. And, and the love that He shows to those who are in His family, to those who will repent and will turn to Him. Okay, this is not, this is not a bondage. This is not... This is freedom, freedom from sin. That's what it says here, okay? We can be free from all of those things that we talked about, right? We who were walking in darkness, given this life and this love of God, he would die for people who have rebelled against him. It's, it's amazing. It's an amazing love and an amazing God that we serve. So that is, that is the end of my message this morning. And I hope that if you're, if you've been saved and you're in here, that we take some time to just reflect on the, on that fact, that love, that relationship that we personally get to have with Christ, that he died for our sins. And if you haven't had that, then I pray that you would repent and put your faith in Him and make Jesus the Lord of your life so that you can know the joy and the relief and the freedom that you have in Him. Okay, so I'm going to pray. Father God, God, I thank you for just the opportunity to be here to gather together, God, for your word for the truth in it, God, and that, that it points to you. It, it's, it's all about you, God. We do this for your glory. We thank you, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.